Um, my message this morning, I'm going to start from uh, James chapter 1. And as I've said many times in the last few months, is that there's a lot of times that you have to work on fundamentals. Um, sometimes it may seem elementary, but everybody needs a reminder every now and then. I know that there's not a meeting we have where I work that they're, they're not telling us, you know, follow your processes. You know, you've got processes in place. They're there for a reason. You know, you need to follow them. Well, you know what? God's got some processes in place as well. And we need to make sure that we follow them on a daily basis. Because if, if there's a kink in the process, then you know what? The goal is probably not going to be reached. So we've all got a goal this morning, don't we? Has everybody got a goal? My goal is to make it to heaven. That's my goal. And part of that goal is to try and take as many people up there with me as I can. So I'd love for every single person in this room to come with me. If I could put everybody on a boat or a plane and we all just go and take off and, you know, set sail or set off towards heaven, you know, that'd be fine with me. You know, we can leave it all behind right now. But while we're here, guess what? There's work to be done. There's still work to be done. So let's get to work this morning. How's that sound? James 1, starting with verse 19, it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now notice there, he put, so then, my beloved brethren. He wasn't talking to strangers when he was saying these things. He was talking to the people that were around him, his followers, the people that, that looked up to him that, that probably that he was closest to. He's, he's giving them life lessons right here. He's giving them some processes. Be swift to hear. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So, these are some things Jesus is talking to him here. These are some things that we've all been a part of our whole lives. I'm kind of piggybacking this message off of what I talked about last week. Because, yes, there's, there's truth. But you know what? There's got to be some obedience to follow the truth. There's got to be obedience there. So how do we become obedient? I told Casey this morning, just, just this morning, that I'm going to have a lot of, I'm, I'm sure I've got so many you know, little different rabbit trails that I could go off of because I've got so much material at the house raising two little girls that I could talk about obedience. I'm telling you. I mean, you sit there and you call their name time after time after time after time. And it's hard to get them to listen sometimes. 
It is. If you've got if you if you've got young kids or I guess maybe if you've got, you know, grown kids, <laughs> sometimes it's hard to get them to listen. If you're married, sometimes it's hard to get them to listen. I mean, come on, let's we can be honest in this place this morning. I mean, if we're not being honest, then something's wrong. Hey, there's there's obedience problems sometimes. This is this is how you become obedient. All right. First off, he says right here in verse 19, be swift to hear. Swift to hear. You know, in order for us to be able to hear something, we've got to shut our mouths ourselves, don't we? And I mean, that's that's tough sometimes. But, you know, you can sit there and blah, 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 and you'll miss. You'll miss everything that's trying to be told to you. If you're If you're making noise. Also, you know, maybe it's not you that's making the noise, but maybe you've surrounded your life with noise that doesn't need to be there. And you can't hear what's trying to be told to you. So it says, be swift to hear and slow to speak. One thing I've always taken from that slow to speak is the fact that a lot of, a lot of times when, when somebody's giving you some instruction, if we do hear it and we do listen, a lot of times we play it back in our heads and then we're like, well, why don't I do it this way? You know, I know you're telling me to do it this way, but, you know, why can't I do it this way? Be slow to speak. Think. Especially if you've got somebody that's trying to give you some wisdom and some knowledge, take it in, okay? Because more than likely they've been there before. There's a lot of times that we take stuff that, that people are trying to, you know, give us advice on and we just throw it to the wayside. When in the end, it would have been so much easier to listen to them. Case in point, my parents. There's so many different times that they've told me, you know, Levi, you know, I went through this and this is the way it happened. This is what went down. And, you know, if, if you're smart, you'll do it this way. Guess what Levi did? Levi did it his way and messed it up. You've got a God that constantly tries to reach out to you to tell you, you know what? Do it this way. And we are constantly trying to still do it our way. We're fighting against God. We're fighting against Him and we're fighting against ourselves. We dig our own holes. I didn't use the word burrow. <laughs> Georgia dug their own, own hole last night. So, just saying. And they got disappointed. If you don't want disappointment in your life, don't dig your own hole. Listen. So it says, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. That's, that's what I was talking about with all that noise that surrounds you. You've got to get some things out of your life. Okay? Sometimes people wonder, well, why isn't God talking to me? You know, why can't I hear Him? And it's because all the other stuff that's going on around you. Sometimes you've got to get to a point where it's just you and God. And then you can hear that still small voice of him saying, you know what? I'm here. And now that I'm here, this is the plan. But what keeps us? What keeps us from doing that? Well, it talks about here that, you know, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. But then it says he immediately forgets what kind of man he was, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful here. You know, when I, when I think about that, you know, looking in a mirror, you know, a lot of times we like to complain about, you know, all these different things we've got going on in our life and how 
you know, tough life is and, and, you know, different situations that we get into. And what I've learned is that most of the problem is what I'm looking at in the mirror. It's my own fault for the things that I do and the choices that I make. And I know I said, I said, you know, last week that, you know, you live with a lot of people in this life. You know, you, you know, maybe gone to college and had roommates and kids and all this stuff, but, you know, people come and go, but you're going to have to live with yourself your whole life. And that's for sure. So we've got to make decisions that are going to improve ourselves. That's going to keep us spiritually sound. Now, right here it says in verse 25, it says that, you know, if, if you've got yourself in God's will, in God's plan, that you won't be a forgetful here. You won't forget. I don't want to forget what God has, has told me. It says right here that you won't be a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. A doer. So when God gives you something, take it and then go out and do it. There's got to be some action on your part to go out and do the work that God wants you to do. Just like I said this morning before we got started, let's get to work. You know what? There is work to be done. There's continuously work to be done. If you ever feel like that your work is done, it's not. There's always something else. There's somewhere else in some kind of capacity that God can use you. And instead of, you know, being lazy and sitting down and saying, well, you know what? I did enough for too long. I'm just going to sit here. Don't do that. Let God continue to use you your whole life. It's a race. All right? It's a race. We, uh, we talked about that goal. We've got a goal. All right? There's a goal out there to get to heaven. Don't stop. Don't quit. Just keep on moving. I know I've said it a lot of times over the last few weeks, but keep moving forward. You know, it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's going to be... It's, it's not always going to be a full-on sprint. It's, it's not always going to be, you know, jogging. There's times that you're going to be on your knees and you're going to be crawling. But don't stop moving towards God and the promises He has for you. Now, obedience. I want to talk about two different, two different um, stories in the Bible that, that deal with obedience. And I know that these are well-known stories, so I'm not telling you anything new with these stories that, you know, this isn't going to be some kind of life-altering, you know, thing when you hear this. But I want, to, I want to go through these and I want to show you what obedience can do for you. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, it says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now, I could stop right there, and, and that would preach for a while, because I can tell you this with, with, with my children, and I'm sure that you can say this with your own families, that sometimes you call somebody's name, and you have to, like I said, constantly call and call and call. And there's no answer to the call. But notice that, that God right here, he, he said Abraham's name. He said, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. How many of you this morning is God calling and you're just not listening? You're not saying, here I am, God. What, you know, what, what do you need? What do you need done? You know, I'm, I'm here to do it. He might be calling you this morning and, and you're, not, you're not present. You're not here. I want him to know that I'm here. Abraham stood up. He said, here I am. Now here's the tough part. 
Then he said, take your own son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. This would have been tough right here. I can't imagine what Abraham was going through. And you know, I mean, it, it goes through a timeline right here. It doesn't break down every little thing. It doesn't, it doesn't say, you know, if Abraham, you know, questioned God or anything like that. But I honestly think that if he had questioned God, that it would have been put in God's word. It doesn't say that he questioned God. But when I read this, it makes it really hard to grasp from a human standpoint that God wanted Abraham to take the thing that he loved the most, the greatest joy in his life, and he wanted Abraham to sacrifice it. And I'm, I'm sure if God told me to do that, I'm just going to be honest with you, I'd probably have questions. There'd, pro there'd be part of me that said, you know what, God, are you, are you sure about this? Because, you know, I, I don't know if I'm ready to let go. You know, I don't know if I can, you know, give the greatest joy I've got in my life and just, you know. But Abraham did. He listened. It says he rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey. He got the wood for the offering. And he went to the place where God had told him. He was obedient. He followed instruction. Not only when God called him did he say, here I am, and he listened, but he followed. You know, you can listen to somebody all you want to, but if you're not acting on what's being told to you, then you're missing out. You're not being obedient. What's God trying to tell you right now? What's God trying to reach out and tell you to try and help you in your current situation? It says in verse 7, jumping down, it says, But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. When I was reading that this morning, as I was putting this into putting these verses in the computer, I read that verse just in itself. Just that verse, just focusing on those words. God will provide himself the lamb. And that just stuck out to me big time. You know, God gave us a gift. He gave us a blessing by sending Jesus. You know, we want to talk about, you know, Christmas and, you know, him being born. And, it, and it's great, but, you know, he was born with a purpose. He was born... Because God had already, God already knew that He was going to have to be sacrificed. You know, God sacrificed His Son so that we could have life. He sacrificed His Son so that we could have the blessings. And I think that Abraham got that. I think Abraham knew that, you know what, if God... It's telling me to sacrifice Isaac. It's got to be for a reason. You know, and, and, and God's going to bless it regardless. But he said, and, and I don't know if he said this in faith. Maybe, maybe he did. Maybe Abraham knew that he was being tested. But he knew that, you know what? I've got to carry on and I've got to go through the test in order to get to the end. To get to the reward. 
So it says that God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son in perfect obedience. Did exactly what God said. He bound him. He laid him up on the altar. And he's getting ready to do the will of God. Probably the toughest thing he's ever done in his life. Getting ready to sacrifice what he loved so much. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. Notice he got called again. And he stopped. And he said, here I am. That's another thing. Is you, you know, we, we may be carrying out some plans that we've got. And yeah, maybe it's God's plan. But you know what? God will change our plans every now and then. God will change His plan every now and then. Obviously, right here, you know, God had a plan. And then He had a plan to stop Abraham as well. So notice that when the angel said His name again, He said, Here I am. Here I am. He stopped what he was doing. He was focused on what the angel had to say. What God had to say. We've got to focus on what God once said. We've got to block everything else out. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear or respect that word fear means respect, God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, that's a great story of obedience right there. Abraham did everything that God told him to. And you know what? Yeah, it was tough. But in the end, God provided and God blessed. And that's what God will do when you're obedient. He'll take care of you. All right? Just like I said last week with the Jeremiah 29 11, or it might have been Wednesday night. You know, he's got a plan for your life. He's got a future for you. But when he's talking to you, when he's trying to get through to you, you've got to listen. You've got to be obedient. And don't just listen, but do it. Don't be just hearers. Be doers. We've got to be a doing church. We've got to be a doing people. He doesn't want us to just, you know, gather gather up and just keep everything in here and just he doesn't want that he wants us to go out and do the work there's work that needs to be done so now i'm going to talk to you about god telling somebody to go do some work and this is like i said this is another story that i mean I, i've been taught this story ever since i was a young boy i've been told i couldn't say little because I was never little. So, anyways, Jonah 1, 1 and 3, 1 through 3. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness had come up before me. So he gave Jonah simple instructions here. He says, you know what? I want you to go here and I want you to preach to these people because there's wickedness all around the land and they need preaching to. He gave him instructions. Now, this is why I said it's so important to be hearers and doers because notice here that Jonah heard what God told him to do. 
but he didn't do it. It's one thing to hear God. It's another thing to listen and do. If God's putting something on your heart, you need to listen and you need to do it. We'll see here in this story why it's so important. It says, Jonah arose to flee from, this is a tough word to say, Tarshish. I'm sorry. He arose to flee from Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So instead of doing God's work, Jonah is going from the presence of the Lord right now. He's, he's going the opposite way. It says, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. What I want us to think about this morning is Jonah's disobedience was now affecting a whole other group of people. He was putting a whole other group of people in danger because of his disobedience for not following the call we're not following God's instructions. And these people were facing a huge storm that had rose up against them. And I mean, they started throwing stuff off the boat, started trying to figure out, you know, what was going on. They knew that there was something there that had caused this storm to rise up, a spirit there that didn't need to be there. I'm telling you, if you look at this as a boat this morning, if there's a spirit that doesn't need to be in this place, it needs to go. And we need to pray until it does go. Until then, there's going to continuously be a storm that is present. There will not be peace. But you know what? The thing that was Jonah that was bringing all this up he knew it, and he was down at the bottom of the boat. He was hiding. He was in hiding. You know, sitting down there, knowing that he was, he was tear about, you know, he was causing this ship to tear apart. It says the ship was getting, be, be, uh, getting ready to be broken in two. Getting ready to be broken in two. This wooden boat. So they're trying to figure out, you know, what do they need to get off this ship in order for it to be calm again so they can move on. So the captain said to Jonah, he said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. They cast lots, and it fell on him. You know, there's so many times, and I know I told that story last week about, you know, the, the lie that I told that lasted for years. And you know what? It, you know, it is what it is. It, you know, it, it went on and went on. But I'll tell you this. Most of the times, if I was disobedient and I lied about something, it came out pretty quick. It did. And it was a lot worse when it came out than if I'd have just, you know, been honest in the first place. And so if Jonah would have been honest in the first place, instead of them having to throw all kinds of cargo off the ship, instead of all these people being in a panic, if he would have just been honest, it would have saved them a lot of trouble. But notice that they... Jonah, he still wasn't honest. Even when the captain came and talked to him, they had to cast lots in order to figure out that it was Jonah. Just know that God will find you out. He will. 
He'll find you out. Jumping down to verse 15, it says, So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Problem gone. No more storm. Everything's good. The boat's still intact. But they knew they had to get rid of Jonah. They didn't want to. They even said, you know, God, we don't want to shed this innocent man's blood. But Jonah, in the end, knew that he had to go. Or he was about to cost. He was about to cost everybody's life. He was about to cause all kinds of chaos. So they threw Jonah into the sea. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So when I read this, one thing that, that really stood out is the fact that even in disobedience, God was still taking care of Jonah. He didn't let him drown. He had prepared a place where Jonah could go, where Jonah could be held until Jonah fixed things inside himself. And I got to thinking, you know, how many times in a spiritual sense have I been in the belly of the whale or the fish? Excuse me. Scientists say it's not a whale. So, yeah. It says that God prepared a fish. How many times has God prepared a place for me that, that I could stay and that I could work myself out, that I could work things going on inside of me? And how many times did I? How many times was I working as I was doing that? I want you to know it says that Jonah was in the belly of that well for three days and three nights. And while he was in there, Jonah did some working out. He got himself back strong. He got himself back right. And I want you to listen to what his prayer was here. It says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have owed. Salvation is of the Lord. He started giving him praise. He started giving God praise that, that you know, that should have been there the whole time. He was being obedient, finally. And finally here, once Jonah got obedient, once he worked everything out inside of him and removed that spirit from inside of him of, hey, you know, I don't want to go to this place and, and preach to these people. And he got that, that spirit outside of his body and replaced it with a heart of praise and a heart of worship. That's when God delivered him. It says, so the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now that's a miracle in itself when you think about it. That it didn't say it vomited him out into the sea. It said it vomited him out onto dry land. That's incredible. That's, I mean, there's, there's no limitations on what God can do. There's not. But I love the fact here that, that you know, Jonah... That it says here, especially, you know, we just came through Thanksgiving and everything. And I talked about, you know, that Thanksgiving is a spirit. It's not a day or a season. It says that he spoke with the voice of Thanksgiving. And then that God delivered him. Delivered him from that, that area, that place where he was being held. Almost like a prison. He was being contained. So Jonah's disobedience, it led him down some paths that I'm sure that if he'd have known going in that he wouldn't have wanted to go down. But he was there. He couldn't go back and fix it. But you know what? He could change right then. 
and then he could move forward from there. And going back to it, talking about, you know, looking in the mirror and seeing that person in, in front of that mirror that's looking back at you. You know what? You can change. If you're, if you're not being obedient right now, you can change. But it's not going to be anybody else's choice. It has to come from you. You have to change. You have to decide that I'm going to be obedient. You have to remove the noise so you can hear God calling. And you, at the end of the day, are going to be the one that has to go out and do the work. Because it's, it's not God's plan for somebody else. It's God's plan for you. It's God's will for your life. And I know that it's hard sometimes to see, especially when you go back and you think about Abraham and all the different questions that he might have had. And I'm sure Jonah, you know, when he got swallowed up, how many different questions that he may have had running through his brain in those three days and those three nights where he's, you know, sitting there in that belly. And I was reminded of Romans 8. It just kept on popping up in my head. Romans 8, 28. And says, as we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. He's working all things out for our good. A lot of times that we might not understand it, but it's not, it's not for us to understand everything you know god knows what he's doing god knows when you know he sends somebody to speak something into your life you know a lot of times we discredit you know like i said earlier if somebody's trying to give us some advice but who's to say that god didn't put that person in your life to speak right into that moment and you might think well you know, that person's not God. Well, God can speak through anybody. He can. And God is looking for people to speak through. He's looking for people that are going to be obedient, that are going to, to hear when spoken to, that are going to stand up, that are going to listen to the instructions that He's given, and that are going to go out and they're going to do exactly what He wants done the way He wants it done. He's looking for us to be obedient. I want to be obedient in His eyes. I don't want to be, you know, somebody that, you know, He tells me one thing and I do another. I don't want that. If God lays in my heart to do something, then I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And not only am I going to do it, I'm going to try and get, give it everything I got. So if God is telling you something this morning, if He's trying to reach out to you, if maybe if you feel like, maybe some of you might right now feel like that, that you're stuck, that your disobedience has caused you to become stuck, you know what? Just begin to praise Him. Begin to worship Him. And He'll start to remove the things around you that have been clouding up, He'll calm the storm, and then you'll be able to hear Him clearly. I'm going to ask if you'll stand this morning. Going back to verse 22 of my original passage in James 1. It says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving yourselves. Deceiving yourselves. I want you to think about that this morning. How many times have you gotten in your own way of the blessing that God wanted to put into your life? The gift that God wanted to give you. 
you know, we've got to remove ourselves from the equation. We've got to understand that, you know what, this isn't about me. This is about God and what He wants done. And if it, if it takes me, if it takes me giving up the greatest joy that I've ever had in my life, well, then you know what? We've got to do it. Because the simple answer is that this life is filled with constant joys. This life is filled with constant sorrow. But this is why your true joy should be found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He should be your joy. He has to be your joy. And He's not going to leave you. He won't forsake you. You know, we, we talk about lifting Him up and, and giving Him praise and giving Him worship and Him being our Savior. If He's your Savior this morning, I want you to begin to think about that. Think about the sacrifices that Jesus made so that you could be here today. Think about the sacrifices He made so that you could have eternal life. And that you could have the blessings that you have. That, you know, you're going to get in a car, you know, with heating and air inside the car. And you're going to drive out of here. And you're going to, you know, live a, we're living a comfortable life. And God has given us those blessings. He's good. He's been so good to us. And then I ran across this verse. And it hit me in the face. It was like a punch in the gut to me. Luke 6, 46. It says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? And when I read that, I was like, wow. You know, I've got so much, you know, when you talk about Abraham, you know, fearing God and respecting God. I respect God. But there's times that I don't do the things that he says. We've got to do what he says. We've got to not only hear and listen, but we've got to do it. You know, who's to say that, you know, God's got some kind of great blessing that's waiting for your family. And you're the one that's, that's holding it back. Because you're not doing the things that you should be doing. That you're not being obedient. I don't want my obedience or disobedience to get in the way of my blessing. So we've got to be obedient this morning. I'm going to open up the altar here in a second and and I can already hear what that is playing, and it's just running through my brain. And it's let go and let God be God. You know what? I'm not God. You're not God. But from some of my actions and me trying to do things my own way, you'd think that I thought I was God. That I that I know the best way. And there's there's times I don't. And that's why we've just got to learn to let go and to let God do his job, to let him do what he wants to do. There may be something he wants to do in this place this morning. Don't get in the way. Don't get in the way of your blessing and don't get in the way of somebody else's blessing. Be obedient this morning. If God's calling you this morning, answer the call. Say, here I am, God. You know, what can I do? Is there something I need to change? Or, you know, do you want to send me somewhere and tell me to speak to somebody? What is it you want me to do? But just be open to it. Be open to it and be obedient. Do what He wants you to do. And there's no telling what can come of it. Let's pray this morning. Then we're going to open up the altar. I'm going to ask Daddy to sing. Dear God, I pray right now. Jesus, I pray for your anointing to fall on this place. God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to cover us right now. 
God, we may know, we may not know what's going to happen here in the next 10 minutes or the next 10 days or 10 years, but God, we know that you have a plan regardless. God, I pray that you would just begin to open our ears, dear Lord, to where we can hear. And God, that we know we not only hear the plan that you have for us, but God, that you would let us listen to it and act on that plan, dear Lord. Let us be a church that's in action. Let us be a people that is in constant movement for you. God, I pray that you would just take any hearts that are in this place this morning. Jesus, you see the hearts, you see the minds, the souls of the people that are in here right now. God, I pray that you would just turn us all to you. God, I pray that we would never run from your presence, but God, we would run to you. As we're about to open up this altar, God, I pray that you would just begin to, Jesus, just let your anointing begin to take over. God, you know what each and every person in here needs. God, I pray that your work be done in this place this morning. In Jesus' name. This altar is open for anybody who wants to pray. And if you're not praying, 